David, welcome. Thank uh, you. It's good to see you again. We've we've just got back from three weeks in the Caribbean together, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've got to yeah, got to know you quite well. And um, yeah, I've learned learned quite a lot from you. Um, you're a, you're a planning lawyer, yes, uh, yeah. and also a planning consultant. Yep. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I found that particularly interesting. So David, t tell us more about yourself. Uh, well, I kind of uh, describe myself as a bit of a planning property mongrel, really, uh, sort of a, a mix of different disciplines. I started off in surveying uh, initially. I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I started off uh, in professional practice. Uh, my family had a background in property development and property investment, mostly in Bristol, uh, in the Clifton area. And my brother was in agency as well. So it seemed to be a natural steer to go in that direction. So I went into surveying. I started off at a firm called GVA Grimley in Mayfair in central London and I was there for several years. Uh, I went through the general practice charter surveying background, so I had a background in valuation, in agency, then went into planning, and then after a number of years, because I'd already done a, a, a law conversion course, I decided I wanted to go back towards law, but as a planner, as a planning lawyer, and then I qualified as a barrister, and then over time as a solicitor as well, uh, and I moved around local authority departments and worked as a senior or principal planning lawyer and then also worked for a year on the Crossrail Bill, uh, acting mostly for developers and investors whose own assets were, were hit or affected by the, by the Crossrail Bill. Uh, and then went after that into private practice as a solicitor and then um, set up my own business about six or seven years ago as a planning consultant. Uh, and more recently started getting involved directly in property development myself as well, mostly commercial conversions. So it's been varied, it's, it's quite mixed, um, always a bit pragmatic and practical uh, and hands-on, but with a slightly legal side to it as well, which is always very, very useful. It is useful, uh, and that's sort of why I, one of the reasons I found you so interesting. Um, when we were talking, when we were away, um, you came out with a lot of very specific um, legal reasons why councils mm. had to give consent for certain things or mm. why you'd get certain things on appeal and how they needed to be reminded mm -hmm. of some of these um, some of these things. You know, legislation is very, very important. You know, you need to look at the local plan. Mm -hmm. There's all, all sorts of sort of higher level stuff that yep. an average consultant might not do if mm -hmm. you didn't have the legal background. So I, mm -hmm. I found that very interesting talking to you. So tell me a little bit more about the, the structure that you need to go through. Well, structure is very important. Um, one of uh, the most famous barristers in planning law history, um, uh, Sir Desmond Heap, once often said that planning without the law is just wishful thinking. You have to remember that it is effectively it's a legislative background which is layered over with policy, with practice and that sort of thing. So you have to adopt your approach within that structure. So take for instance, what does that mean for, for the average developer who is promoting their own planning application? The starting point is always that their proposals will be judged um, against the prevailing development plan policies unless there are other material considerations. So if you've got a site, you've got to try and put across to the council that it ticks the boxes as far as their development plan goes. If you are promoting a scheme which might be out with or breach those planning policies and you've got to bring in other material considerations, uh, which outweigh, which, which which will outweigh. So yeah. it's a balancing exercise, mm. uh, and that is where the finer arts of it come in. That's where it's it's not so much a science; it's an art. It's the it's the aspect of judgment, the experience that goes along with answering the sort of questions such as how important is this other material consideration against this scheme? How much weight do you give that? how much is that argument going to fly against a council or even this council? Because there may be very specific needs in particular areas which might not necessarily be so compelling in other parts of the country. 
I know with um, with with projects like this, it it's very very important mm. to to understand the the sort of human side of, of yep. what's going on there. I know you've worked within uh, a number of councils, mm. Um, mm. so you you've sort of been on the other side of the table, yes. uh, yep. and you understand how they defend certain things, how they sort of how they operate and, yeah. and how they stop consents happening as, as well as w what it is they, they're looking for and, and what they want to, to, to happen. In different areas as well and not just uh, in a non-contentious atmosphere acting as an advisor to a local authority or to a, a, a landowner but also I've acted as an expert witness in, the, in public inquiries, uh, in high court matters uh, in the leasehold valuation tribunal as well. So you get a sense over time as to how far you can push certain arguments uh, and how far you can test them. Um, of course, the nature to which you can push them and test them will change over time because planning priorities change over time as well. And the law changes as well. Um, and one of the things that we're often having to wrestle with is how those changes of law are taken on by the local authorities and how well officers adapt uh, and I guess it's probably something that we might come to later on but uh, with regards to commercial conversions for instance and office to residential the experience with large commercial conversions particularly in London that I've had is that sometimes you find officers trying to use what they can within the prior approval process to try and wrestle back some control for themselves and there is a tension that's going on in the planning system on the one hand, the Treasury wants more houses built. On the other hand, the DCLG is having to look after vested interests and other people and other interests in local, local communities. Planets, local yeah. communities, exactly. And there is that, um, the need for housing wrestling against the tension against traffic and highways impacts on local communities and, and so on and so forth. It, it's very interesting. Um, I, uh, I've certainly noticed that depending on what area mm. you go to, what mm. council you're dealing with, the results can be very, very different. Mm. I find planning very subjective, yep. um, and um, certainly as you go into higher value areas, further yep. south into London, uh, I'd say it's a more difficult process. Yes. Um, here in Peterborough, um, I'd say you know the, the council is generally pretty reasonable mm. um, in comparison to lots of other areas. Mm. Um, I, I guess it's because they want so much more housing and they need to encourage mm. building and, mm -hmm. and conversion because values are, are not as high. The, yes. the finished property values are not as high. Therefore, you know, they need to make some elements a little bit easier. You yes. know, sills not as difficult, the affordable housing yes. uh, as it would be down south. Mm. So how specifically, because you, you were called to the bar, mm -hmm. how specifically um, being a, a, you know, a, having that sort of lawyer barrister head on how has that helped you specifically over just being a, a normal consultant well in terms first of all in terms of the training how you're trained as a barrister uh, you have to go through advocacy and a lot more in terms of how you're tested and how you're assessed in that and the negotiation skills as well it's the interpersonal skills um, which are tested at a vocational level a lot more so than they are either going through the surveying route, general practice charter survey. I can't speak for um, charter town plan. I didn't go through that route, um, or for that matter, as, as a solicitor. So, it's the soft skills of being able to read a case and to be able to find the strengths and the weaknesses in that case. Not just the strengths and the weaknesses in the other side, but also in your side. So, there's a lot of case preparation that goes on there. It's being able to also guide your clients through the strategy and I find that this is probably one of the most important things to do. It's, it's just like any journey, for instance if you begin a, um, a mountain climb or a long walk, uh, if you set off in the wrong direction then it buggers up the rest of the journey inexorably. I, I am frankly. I'm in that position on a project right now. I right. keep I keep saying to the professionals around me, we've completed, my balls are in the vice, Yes. Um, we've got a get three really good schemes right now. Yeah. We've got to get them into the planners. Um, you know, if we don't do the right things now, it's going to cost me a lot of money later. Yes. Uh, yeah. and, and I know what it's like at, at the beginning of the project, uh, when you've got sort of 10 options looking at you, 
that's the time where you've really got to put the work in. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. It, 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 it pushes you along in a direction. Well, the strategy is, is, is particularly important because that's where, as um, a lawyer, then it begins to cross over to general property experience and general property knowledge. And that's where, for instance, it's help, been helpful for me to be able to combine my background as somebody who used to actually do asset valuations for the banks and also work out development appraisals when I was an agency as well, and reverse premiums and that sort of uh, th that sort of involvement into planning, and then back into law as well. And also, there is a lot of valuation involved in planning. We come across listed buildings. There's mm. some degree of enabling development there. We try and negotiate down on affordable housing. There's an appraisal exercise there as well. So we're all in a position where often, in terms of negotiating with the council, one of the tools in our armoury is whether or not we can afford to do what the council really wants us to do. They'll, have a, they'll start off with a big wish list, and this is quite, co this is quite common on, on very big schemes in particular. In, in fact, the Arsenal redevelopment of their ground, when they promoted their application to Islington Borough Council, they, the council started off with a very, very long wish list and it got whittled down to about two thirds to a half of what it was because of course the, the club couldn't afford to pay the whole lot. Mm. Now that may not be Arsenal Football Club, but it's very much the same principle for any other developer as well. I happen to know the ins and outs of that scheme because I was also a senior planning lawyer at Islington Borough Council shortly after that scheme was coming to an end through its CPA process. But um, it's about bringing those strands together and making sense of them as well. Because it's all very well having the analysis and having the advice. But then you've got to do two things. You've got to put it together within a, a strategy that makes sense for the client or the developer or the investor, whether or not it's somebody else or you. Because, you, I mean, I'm involved now in, in development projects as well. So timing cost, the impact on the cost of holding on to the asset as well. How soon can we refinance, for instance? So the need to get a consent as soon as possible. Uh, and the um, perhaps sometimes what we call salami slicing our way through the project. Not going for too much too soon, but trying to establish mm -hmm. some form of development and then moving up from that so it doesn't scare the council. So you're slowly immersing them in the hot water rather than <laughs> dropping them in. Um, <laughs> they might just leap out. Um, and then the other thing is holding the, not just the client's hand, but actually also having to take the planners through that process mm. and explaining it to the planners. I have seen so many projects that quite frankly would have had a much better chance, if not a guaranteed certainty of getting planning, had the story being told more clearly to the officers, had mm. they been clear about what was proposed, had the details made sense to them, had it had a, a theme to them which sometimes it taps in to something that's going on in the background. For instance, if you can find an angle in a development project which you know the local authority are looking for, perhaps on a political level, then you sometimes you can get that political buy-in or high-level buy-in from maybe not chief executive or leader level, but certainly from head of development control level. So it's about pressing the right buttons, but also having that coordinated holistic approach as well. Okay, so that's, that's really interesting. You, you're obviously going, getting into a little bit more of the meat here, mm. and, you know, in terms of how, how the planning system and, and officers and councils work. So in practical terms, what sort of projects are you involved with yourself at the moment and for other people? What, wh where is the weight of your work? What, what sort of projects? Well, they vary. Um, the smallest projects tend to be uh, extensions to houses, but I tend to, I don't, don't tend to do so much of that sort of work this, uh, these days. Most of it tends to be larger development work maybe four or five houses plus, or uh, particularly on commercial conversions, offices to resi. Uh, the largest project I'm dealing with at the moment, uh, we're going through planning for about um, 40 to 50 units uh, on 
um, the prior approval stage and then we'll be going up to about 80 to 90 units on the planning application and there's another project which actually is of a very similar size which I've just started advising on as well which was um, well which is for prior approval for about 60 units and that will be a doubling on the planning applications. Stage. So so the prior approval process is what you would use where you take an office yes. and convert it into apartments usually. Absolutely. Um, so basically you don't need planning permission to go from B1 office to C3 residential. No, no. And it's, I, it's an abbreviated process. There is, um, the thing is that, um, and perhaps this might be semantics to some, but it makes a difference in terms of process because there's permitted development and there's prior approval. It's very important to realise that the office to resi conversion is a prior approval, it's not a permitted development. Permitted development is, in a sense, it's the big circle and in which prior approval falls. Prior approval is a subset of permitted development, it's a type of permitted development. But the reason why that there is an important distinction there is because there is an element of subjectivity a lot more in prior approval. It's an abbreviated fast track planning process. So um, everything is irrelevant in terms of planning unless it's made relevant in terms of planning within the prior approval process. And the only thing that Parliament said you can have you can consider as relevant within the prior approval process is traffic and highways, flood risk, contamination and noise from neighbours on the future um, occupiers of the of the converted. So that cuts a load of cuts a lot of stuff. Uh, cut, cut, cuts a lot of work yeah. out, yeah. and it also cuts out a lot of areas within which the council can effectively refuse. Oh, it's massive. Um, it's massive. A, a, a an office to, to residential conversion. It's and I, I've noticed in practical <coughs> terms, a they get through a lot quicker. Yes. Like they do get through in six eight weeks usually. Yeah. I mean, I remember. One that I applied for, we, we applied for one of the first ones in Peterborough, if not the first one. Um, and I remember it was two pages. We didn't even send plans in and it came back and it was approved. Mm. Seems to be a little bit more detailed now. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, the whole process was very, very easy. Mm. Something that, that I've, I've noticed um, is, is you know a big benefit mm. on, on these types of projects and certainly the ones we've done on is they, they can't really say anything about unit sizes so yeah. if you want to do smaller units fine crack yeah. on yeah uh, if you're trying to get planning permission they'll probably try and stop you yes uh, they may not try and defend it based on unit sizes but they'll use some other excuse and yeah. then when you see them yeah. they'll they'll say oh well we can't defend the unit sizes but we think they're too small and if you do them that size we're going to cause you a problem over here yes um, yeah. so yeah. Uh, <laughs> take from that what you will but with an office they don't don't seem to be able to do that and they certainly haven't with us the other thing is light and mm -hmm. proximity to, you know, proximity of the flats, so views out of the flats. Mm -hmm. You know, say you're looking into a courtyard, mm -hmm. so councils don't like that. Maybe they want 20 metres between the yep. windows yep. and they won't want overlooking. Doesn't apply with no. the offices. No, they, they can't, can't consider it. No. So I know on the conversions that I've done, those are the two big things um, that, that have benefited me mm -hmm. uh, from, from taking an office and converting it. You can go to smaller units and, and of course the, the views and the light and all that sort of stuff isn't considered, uh, which, which, which can be an issue. Uh, and of course, the other major thing is there's no affordable housing Absolutely. contributions yep. Yep. and no yep. sell yes. and, and no yep. 106. Yes. So pretty major things. Yes. And, and and obviously, you know, big big benefit there. Downside is those buildings are, you know, they're getting bid up, aren't they? Everyone's after yes. them. Yep. Um, so actually my strategy has sort of gone somewhat the other way, mm. whereby I'm looking for a lot of buildings that need planning mm -hmm. because there are less people chasing them. Yes. And the agents are less sort of, oh, well, you can do this, this and this. And, you know, I saw a building yeah. complete recently that I had agreed at 480,000. Granted, it was probably 2013. Uh, and it sold last year for 1.3 million at auction. And mm -hmm. they didn't complete, but it ended up completing at 1.2. Mm -hmm. um, no idea on this planet how that development's going to work. Mm -hmm. No idea how they're going to make money from it. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty clear um, that they're struggling. You know, mm -hmm. it's been set empty for a while. And, you know, there are quite a few of those projects where the price is, in, you know, they've gone too far. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, in, in, in your opinion, are the, 
you know, the office thing is good, but are there some other little sort of quirks and things that you can use to your advantage to, you know, get you through the planning process, but keep some good margin in those deals? Well, one of the big debates I often have with clients is, uh, first of all, where there may be permitted development that we can use or where we can uh, test the scheme as well. So permitted in terms of permitted development, if you're looking at an existing residential building, then uh, you'll be limited in terms of what you can do unless it's, a, it's an existing house. So let's, let's take the, the smaller project, for instance, where there may be people who are developing HMOs or changing the use there. So most of the permitted development rights, which give you a larger floor space, you're going to have to get that permitted development sewn up before you then change the use. Because when you come out of dwelling houses, then, for instance, if you change it to flats, then you can't use the what's called the Class A permitted development rights to extend it ground floor, first floor at the side and roof level, so on and so forth. Um, the, the planning play is very, very important. Um, we often find that uh, there are a lot of properties who are, that are coming onto the market which are in offices, but the vendors know something about the Class O permitted development rights or prior approval rights to go from office to resi. They might even have obtained mm. a certificate, but they don't know how to work the certificate to its maximum. Uh, and so what they'll often do is they'll try and get the safest scheme through as they possibly can. You often might find, for instance, you, they, they bring forward 12 units and there's 12 car parking spaces. But if you're almost right on top of a station and you've got excellent public transport links and they're all studio units and therefore, and the council actually wants to encourage um, people to use other forms of transport other than the, pri than the private car then you might say, well, actually, um, we only need to use six of those spaces because there's a lower propensity to use the car with the studio units. That leaves us with six spaces spare, which we can use for six other units, which we might be able to build on top. So that gives us some margin uh, in terms of forward planning your next, your next phase and your next stage. You're just soaking a little bit more out of the scheme than the vendor could be bothered to do so himself mm -hmm. in the first place, or knew, perhaps knew how to do. Um, there's now also the possibility of more changes coming forward under the commercial sphere to, in terms of prior approval. So this is interesting. Mm. Okay. So there's B1C, which is light industrial, being so workshops and the like, being changed or the ability to change those to residential. Which doesn't currently exist. You need full planning permission at the moment Absolutely. for those. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's always a catch with these things, so if it's in what's called a key employment area, you can't, uh, you, they don't have the, the prior approval, you won't have the prior approval for that. The prior approval actually doesn't come into force until the end of September of this year. And then it's available for three years. It's pretty much like a, the, the trial provision that there was for officers from 2013 to 2016. So I fully expect that as long as it doesn't result in too much harm in terms of employment mm -hmm. in local areas, yeah. then, the cap, then the government might take the opportunity to try and extend. Whether or not or we'll see councils trying to exclude some of these areas that might otherwise have permitted development from article f through Article 4 directions, well, we'll have to wait and see. These, office, these light industrial units also have to have been in light industrial use as of 2014 if they were older than 2014. It's also limited to 500 square metres of the existing floor space. So that might be sort of, I don't know, eight, nine, ten apartments, yes. which I think it's certainly, you know, it's good, you know, when, when you're starting out. I mean, I started with a, a terraced house yeah. and then I just built up. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, for me, I think it's it's great to be doing smaller projects, certainly when you're on the way up. Um, to me, that's a little bit annoying. Um, okay. I, would, I would, you know, if, if, if you could go and do sort of 30, 20, 30, 40 yeah. apartments, yeah. that would be really, really good. But, you know, that, that'll be good for many, many people. And I think therein lies an opportunity because 
many of the bigger developers, they won't want to do eight units or nine units. Quite, absolutely. It gives you a, an opportunity to get into that market yeah. where there's less competition. But so the interesting thing about that is actually the way it's phrased within the legislation. And then it actually refers to existing floor space, 500 square metres. Now, I have to bear in mind that a lot of these light industrial units will have loading bays. Mm. And therefore, they will probably be double height. So let's say it's a 500 square metre uh, footprint to the loading bay. Then there is a possibility you could get 1,000 square metres in terms of new floor space internally. I say it's a possibility because, of course, this is all yet to be tested. Mm. And there will always be that initial period where people might try and take the risk, they might try and push it, and you'll get away with some councils and you won't get away with others. Uh, and people will obviously throw their hands up in the air and say, what's going on? Why, why can you get it through with one council and why you can't get it through with others? That's the reality of the planning system. That's the reality of the planning system, yeah. absolutely right. Uh, so there are those opportunities there. There are also opportunities for uh, negotiating vacant through vacant building credits. Um, How does that work? Because that's, that's quite good. I know Glendale got us onto this. Yes. Um, vacant building credit. So what, what does that do? The principle is that the government wants to encourage uh, the development of brownfield land and the re reuse of existing and vacant sites. So if you have a site which has been vacant for a period of time, a period of time might be 12 months, but it's largely it's left up to the council to try and to say what that period of time will be. Uh, but if it's been left open for that period of time, then the floor area of the existing building is used to discount from mm. how much you'd have to provide in terms of affordable housing. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. Now this is of course, this is only for planning permission because there's no affordable housing relevant for prior approval. No, but with buildings that require planning permission, yes. if they've been empty for a while, yeah. there may be no affordable housing contributions to make because of the, uh, the vacant building credit. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. and that only started in June 16. Well, it was reintroduced, I think, off the back of a, was it an appeal court ruling. Yeah, well, I think it came in initially in the initial uh, revisions to the National Planning Policy Framework. It came in all at the same time as other measures to try and reduce affordable housing burden on developers. One of those was the government said, if you are proposing uh, more or rather less than 10 units, so one to nine new units, then you shouldn't be asked for affordable housing from the local authority. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of local authorities who didn't like that. And two of them in particular, I think they were um, Central Bucks and, uh, and Reading Borough Council. Uh, they challenged, or well Central Berkshire, it was West Berkshire uh, District Council and, and Reading, they challenged the government by saying, well, actually, this makes a big impact on local authorities and their budgets mm -hmm. and the ability to provide affordable housing and to bring forward uh, and to achieve those priorities in their local area. And therefore, we've not been consulted on it. You've just rode, ru yeah. rode roughshod over local authorities and therefore that policy is unlawful needs to be taken out of the National Planning Policy Framework. Now, and when, when was that MPPF? introduced that was in november 2014 okay yeah i think i think it was 2014 so it's taken a couple of years for it to, to get to court yes yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. and that that was that nppf revision was taken out by the high court and then uh the dclg department for communities and local government they challenged that they took it to the court of appeal mm. and in may 2016 the court of appeal decision came through and actually they won on all counts. They basically said that actually the policy is entirely lawful uh, and there's nothing wrong with it. And the decision mostly got press for its decision with relation to affordable housing burden on below 10 units. Mm. But it also actually dealt with vacant yeah. building credits, which is worth going through the judgment well, and setting that. For me, I that. mean, it's, um, you know, I, I, I like the sound of that one. Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll be using it. Okay. So... Any other permitted development rights which you can see on the horizon? Because the, these are sort of where it's at. I often find with these permitted development rights, they're good for a while mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. everyone sort of understands them. Yep. Uh, I tend to sort of go around town and um, look at buildings that work 
but um, probably don't, don't mention too much of this stuff to the agents because then they um, they tend to just distribute it, don't they? Yes. And yeah, then it, yeah. uh, it becomes very difficult to buy these buildings. Indeed. Yeah. Um, so what what what's on the horizon? What's early? The government was initially when it was looking at what was called the sunset provision for offices to resi. It was looking at perhaps uh, opening this out to not just internal changes to the floor space, but also allowing for some demolition or part demolition and rebuilding for residential. Uh, and uh, I don't know why that wasn't brought forward. It's probably because it was particularly complicated and would have required a lot of intricate drafting, maybe a lot of caveats to it as well to safeguard local interests. But um, when the, what was called the sunset provision, which was the provision which said the law comes to an end in May 2016 and therefore then it's back to normal after that. When that was removed and therefore that law became permanent, that new provision didn't come in as law. So it was effectively it was everything that happened before, minor, a bar a few tweaks, such as the introduction of noise, and, uh, noise impact on future residents, that then came in. So there was a hiatus while people were waiting to see what had happened. The government had never abandoned the idea or published that it was going to abandon the idea. So what it's now doing is it's actually now revisiting that idea. It'll be interesting to see whether or not there may be prior approval available for Office to Resi on new build. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, I've also um, heard on the grapevine that there may be some other rights coming. Um, from memory, I think there were cinemas and maybe gaming. Yep. Are they here yet or about to maybe? Uh, too, too early to say at the moment. Yeah. I mean, a lot. Um, the problem is with a lot of new law, it has to go through mm. a period of consultation yeah. first. Often also what happens is the government likes to leak these ideas first. T what, test soft, the water. Soft test the water. Yeah, test the water. I went to a parliamentary um, talk and lunch with Brandon Lewis. Um, it was actually about, I think it was about six months before they decided to make the office to resi permanent. Yeah. It was around um, August, October time uh, in 2015. And it was at that lunch, he also announced that they'd be looking to mm -hmm. uh, A, fight the High Court decision, which uh, was made in favor of Reading and West Berkshire, uh, but also to say that they might be bringing in new law in relation to redevelopment and new build office to resi. So uh, officers, uh, well, civil servants are smart. They're not going to be uh, putting these things out there, even in a private lunch. Um, they're going to know that, uh, much like in the agency world, where every everybody says it's off market, the news has already got around. So they're soft testing it at the moment. And then they'll probably produce uh, a paper, a consultation paper, it'll go out uh, to local authorities, it'll be uh, tested more formally, they'll receive responses in, and they may be tweaking the law and see what happens as well. Even after the law comes in, there's always a period where you need the law to settle down as well. There'll be a period of testing with local authorities, things go to appeal, then they go to the High Court sometimes, or even to the Court of Appeal as well. So you don't get absolute certainty, unfortunately, with permitted development rights until sometime maybe three or four years after they've actually been introduced. It's quite interesting. Um, the, 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 some of these new permitted development rights, mm. like the B1C industrial, mm. um, trying to get your head around how you know, they will or they won't allow you to put extra floors in, mm. And, mm. and specifically the externals of the building. Cause yes. You know, with, with offices, when you convert those, you pretty much do what you want inside, but you need to change windows, you yeah. need to change elevations, you know, entrance areas, you need planning permission for that. Yeah. Well, with an industrial unit, it's going to be even more extreme. Mm -hmm. you're, you're going to need um, to get consent for the, 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 the exterior elevations, yeah. um, you know, if you want to change them, yeah. which yeah. you're going to want to do. And some of them might need stripping back to frame as well, mm. because they're so poorly insulated. I mean, some of the worst office buildings are not that particularly well insulated in the first place. 
but there's an awful lot you can do in terms of new skin inside the building, yeah. if not outside as Which well. Which we normally, I mean, you yeah, can exactly. put all your board in, can't yes, you? Yes, exactly. Kaufman, you know. Yeah. 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 Just get all that kind of slapped up and, uh, it, you know, you, you meet all the current sort of, you know, the, the U values and the yes. building regs are all sorted usually yeah, yeah, when, you've, yeah. when, you've, when you've done all that. Yeah. I think, um, I think it's quite interesting though, the, the, an, another new right which um, they talked about in the green paper was, was bringing, was allowing owners to, to apply for planning permission to bring the height of their building up to those around, um, you know, around their building. And, yeah. and, and that, you know, at the moment that requires full planning permission, but that may become a permitted development right as well yeah. in the future. Yeah. Clearly, it'll have to go through a process. But I mean, I just can't imagine what process that that will be. I mean, that's got to be reasonably involved because there's there's going to be you know there's overlooking issues, there's light issues, there's all sorts of stuff that that could generate. Well, the daylight and sunlight issues um, aside, and I'll come back to those in a moment because they're actually technical reasons why that might not necessarily be so much of a problem, depending upon the situation. But uh, I have in mind, and I don't know whether or, not the lo whether or not the government also have this in mind as well, but for instance, do you know with Class A permitted development rights on houses, where you can normally extend three metres out mm. to the back on semi-detached or terraced, or four metres out uh, on detached, and then you can double those respectively uh, through what's called another prior approval process. But effectively, then, if you have a house and you want to make those further extensions, you put in a prior approval first to see if there's any objections. It gets tested on amenity with the immediate neighbours, not the wider area, but they only consult with the immediate neighbours. And if there are then no objections, then it gets tested against all the other permits. That's interesting. Right. So there might nice be a two-stage process. There's there. a nice little trick there, isn't yes. there? Yes. So yeah. it, it might, that might be that might be how it works. Um, again, yet to see how it works mm. out. Um, one thing that's actually worth bearing in mind uh, with uh, sunlight and daylight, and this is actually also relevant for commercial buildings. Let's say, for instance, you have um, a row of buildings and you have building A, B and C. And building A and C, either side of building B, they're both um, four-storey buildings mm. and you have a two-storey building or a three-storey building, building B mm. in the middle. Then let's say that, for instance, you have windows either side looking inwards on to A the and side C. on mm. A and C. Mm. So obviously if you're going to bring that storey height up in B, it's going to affect the sunlight and daylight to those windows. However, there is an appendix within the Building Research Establishment Sunlight and Daylight Guidance, which says that if you have an established pattern of, of height within a terrace or row of buildings, then you can assume a mirror image of that building, so it would be a mirror image of a building A or mirror, mirror image of building C, uh, in terms of assessing the established sunlight and daylight as a baseline. Now, it's a little bit more involved than that, but effectively, that's the gist of what it says. Mm, that's interesting. So, people who inhabit buildings either side, taller buildings, yes, yes. Uh, may lose views, may lose, you know, I suppose views don't count anyway, but daylight. In terms of sunlight and daylight. Sunlight, yes. daylight, and overlooking as well, and, and they may not be able to do anything about it with these new permitted development rights. Overlooking will be, might, could, could still be a separate ground for okay. refusal. Yep. It only helps in terms, of, in terms of sunlight and daylight, yeah, because the BRE is not guidance for anything out with the sunlight and daylight. It's interesting, very, very interesting. And um, I, I certainly like the little sort of tweaks and, and, mm. and tricks because um, I just think when you understand those, I think that's how you, you make a deal really work and, yeah. and, and, and really start to make money. That's when it gets interesting mm, mm. Uh, because the, the average Joe doesn't know how to do that and, um, and, and therefore you end up sort of being able to maybe bid on a building, pay a little bit more money for it, yeah. get the building, add a bit more value, uh, you end up making money. Any other little sort of tips and tricks like that that you could give my listeners to, to, to help them you know, with, with, with when they're, they're looking at buildings to extract more value from them? Well, one of the things that I'm often asked to do is try and get a steer from the local authority before a bid goes in 
as to how likely it is that planning permission might be granted. And you can imagine, your listeners can probably imagine, that it's extremely difficult to get anything persuasive out of the local authority, particularly on matters of detail. And obviously the more you have to drill down into the detail of a proposal, then uh, it becomes almost impossible to be able to give a high level of comfort to investors. However, uh, most matters of detail, fenestration, windows, where they're placed, the layout, those sorts of things, some of those can be worked out through the application. Mm. The more risky elements are things to do with height, things to do with perhaps even the principle of the change of use, if it's a planning play, for instance, and not a prior approval or permitted development play. Um, and where one is looking at effectively matters of principle, then a canny way into the system may be through the planning policy route. The planning departments are usually divided into two. They're usually divided into what's called development control, which is largely reactive. So an application goes in and they're reacting to that. They're giving feedback. Um, and most of the time, if you're asking them for a view before an application goes in, they're looking for the fees. They're looking for pre-app fees. Mm. And so they, they, they want to steer you down that line, not just for financial reasons, but also that, in a sense, sometimes it sounds trite, but sometimes you're expected to play the game in terms of going in with planning, building up that relationship, and they want to be able to discuss that with you. And so I, I suppose it filters people out as well. I mean, if, if everything's yeah. free, then yeah. you probably end up with a lot more people making applications where they're less committed. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if they're having to spend money, you know, it's got more likely to have legs. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But you're just not going to have the time to be able to test through that process yeah. with most bids. Yeah. So what you need to do is you need to pick up the phone to somebody who's not going to put the phone down on you and mm. say, I'm sorry, you're gonna, we're going to have to charge a fee for this. Mm. You're going to have to put in um, four or five different plans for us to test this. So what I often do is I call up the planning policy officers and I said, I'm looking at a building and the conversation would run something along the lines of, I'm not expecting a detailed appraisal here. I just want to test it at a very high level and just get a steer from you about how you feel about these sorts of issues in relation to the building. Now, the reason yeah. I'm telling them about the building is that sometimes in order to be able to give colour to their explanation to me, then they often will then apply it to the building. And I've had times when the planning policy officer has actually gone online while I've been on the phone with them. They've looked up to see where the building is and they've applied the planning policy, not just at a high level, reading back the planning policy to me and saying that generally this is how they would view it, but also almost trying to apply it in a helpful way back to the site that I'm looking at. Interesting. And I that's for free. Yeah, I've had that recently a couple yeah. of times, yeah. uh, and that's sort of at pre-pre-app stage. Yes, yeah. Uh, and I think that's down to the consultant's relationship and, and the way in which they approach the local council and local officers yeah. to, to to get them on board and try and get from them what they want to see. Yes, yeah. I call it. I tend to call it a scoping mm. discussion. Yeah, yeah. I just want to scope the relevant issues with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so really, really interesting, David. And um, you know, I. I learned a little bit more about PD rights there, which um, you know I think I think they're the hot topic and, mm. and they're the thing that people really want to hear about. Um, so you know, thank you for that. I I think it's very pertinent, very here, very now, and I think that's where a lot of the profit is. Mm -hmm. Just give us a, a, a flavour of um, what you've done with Progressive so far. Um, what have you been involved with? I know you came to Grand Cayman with us. What else yeah, have you yeah. done? Well, uh, my journey with Progressive started probably about 18 months ago, actually, uh, at MSOPI. Um, I first met Rob Moore, actually, at a completely different event. It was an entrepreneur's boot camp because I was involved in internet marketing in the background as okay. well. Uh, and Rob was presenting at that event. Then in uh, autumn of, I think it was 2015, I went to MSOPI, uh, made a few contacts, and actually uh, one of my JV partners uh, who I work with, uh, and we work mostly on commercial conversions together. I met him at MSOPI, 
Uh, and then through that, I went through the master classes, uh, the general uh, property master class. I did the HMO master class and no money down master class. Uh, and then went on to do a few more other courses, most recently commercial conversions. And from around the spring of 2016, I started actively looking with my JV partner to find investors to get us involved in development with them. For conversion projects? For conversion projects, And you're yeah. working on a couple of office-to-residential schemes at the moment? Yes, yeah. Which you're sort of a, a partner in? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, uh, the first one, actually, I'm not a partner in because well, these are big projects, and the reality is sometimes... What sort of size are they? Um, this one was bought for five and a half million. Yeah. It's 20,000 square foot. It's yeah. being converted to 48 units under prior approval. Yeah. And then there's a possibility of about 30 to 40 units on top of Interesting. that. Interesting. So about yeah. 20 million yeah. G GDP yeah. Yeah. in East London. Um, it was with um, a client of mine who's now become an investor as yeah. well. And there were a number of full stops, as there often is. We were looking at sites and they <laughs> don't fall. So, they, they so fall, often. They fall out of bed for one reason mm. or another. It took us roughly about eight to nine months to mm. find our first deal from mm. a standing start, which yeah. I was probably it was about the same for you and Rob, I think, wasn't it? Well, I mean, you know, we, we've been investing, what have I, I, I started in, oh God, what was it, 03, something yeah. like that. Um, and, you know, we really got going with little council houses in 05. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, of course, I didn't wait that long for a deal with, with those, but started with the development projects sort of vote 9, 10 yeah. and converting buildings and yeah I, I, I certainly could go with a drought in fact I, I think I had a drought for a couple of years yeah. uh, at yeah. one point where I just couldn't find anything that worked yeah. Uh, yeah. and that, that was quite recently yeah. um, just because everything got overpriced and yeah. you sort of got to let that happen I think as a developer yes. Yes. take a step back just say well everything's too much money Nothing really works. Uh, the market softens a little bit, as yeah. it has done yeah. in the last yeah. few months. Yeah. Um, and you know, I've just got a, an eighty thousand square foot deal, uh, which we've just completed on. Uh, and I suspect that wouldn't have happened a year ago. Yes. Um, but as things have softened, those things become available. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I think it's about timing. I think it's okay to sit on your hands, but mm. when you see something, then. Um, you know, things start working. The market softens. Then, you, then you can go ahead. Yeah, we had a lot of deals that we didn't actually just take. We didn't take forward to our investors. In fact, we were looking at one also. It was also another big deal, which we were about uh, two or three days away from putting in a bid that probably would have won it, and it was for six and a half million. And the property um, I found out uh, was caught by the environmental habitats regulations mm. and I advised the client to pull out. Um, that same client was actually very grateful to us um, and actually became the investor who bought the first property, the one for about uh, uh, five and a half million pounds, which was in East London, which I, I posted, I think, on, on the forums as well, so people have probably seen that one. Mm. Um, but within about two or three months after that, we then uh, got our second deal, which was in Stanmore. Uh, Stanmore Library, which there's a uh, a number of investors involved in that, and that's gone in for prior approval. We've also put in a pre-app as well now. Uh, that would be for a total of about 40 to 45 units, uh, and a similar GDV, slightly less because there's a library on the ground floor, so they're not converting the whole of the building. Um, but it's so much easier that once you've got that first deal over the line, you've got a track record of one. Mm. And so it's a very short conversation now with potential investors. We just take them the particulars for both of those deals and say, this is what we're doing on this, this is what we're doing on this. These are the returns that we're hoping to deliver and we expect to deliver to investors. Uh, and it, it's, it, it's a very easy sell. You actually don't even have to ask them for money. Mm. Interesting, mm. very interesting. Well. It's been uh, it's been really interesting listening to your ideas, David. Um, and uh, I know that people will be very grateful for for you spending your your time to to do this podcast. How can people get in contact with you if they need advice, need help, um, getting planning permission on their buildings? 
The best way is probably through email at first to me at david at drkplanning.co.uk. That's david at drkplanning.co.uk. Or you can drop me a Facebook message, um, usually through uh, Instant Messenger uh, or, um, uh, or through the Progressive Community, and, uh, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. David, thank you. It's, uh, it's been great to, to get to know you better. Thank you, Mark. Cheers.